hopefully. And if not, we have the recording, which I think is going to right. be huge. So where's my attendees up oh, there? They come in. Oh. Mm -hmm. All right. As everybody is entering, welcome. We will get started here in just a moment as we let everybody get connected. I think. Hi. Can they hear me if I'm talking? Maybe? They can hear you if you're talking. And if you want to change the chat to um, you replied to all panelists, you'll want to drop down that menu and do all panelists and attendees. And then you can access, they can see your chat. Well, while you go ahead and uh, chat via our chat feature, I'm going to go ahead and start our webinar. So good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Megan Baylor. I'm the Director of Education and Events. Um, just some housekeeping. We do have a chat feature, which, as you can see, we're already starting to use, as well as a Q&A feature located at the bottom of your viewing window. Um, feel free to ask questions. Uh, throughout the webinar, we will be answering them at the end of the presentation. Tonight's webinar does have video clips during the presentation and you may experience video issues depending on your internet connection. We are recording this webinar, so you will be able to watch them in the replay, um, hopefully without the stress of live streaming on, the, on your network. And that's assuming technology is working with us tonight. Um, first of all, I'd like to start off by thanking our sponsor, Beringer Ingelheim. Tonight we're joined by Nathaniel to tell us more about what they are working on. Thank you, Megan. Um, all right, just going to get a uh, look at this here. It's good to see a lot of names I know, not faces, but names. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, I'm not going to take up a lot of time here at the beginning because I'm really excited about the speaker tonight. I've seen her speak before, and if you haven't, you're really in for a treat. Um, we're really happy to sponsor this. Uh, this is this is really something that we put uh, resources into recently. Um, and I'm just checking. Actually, can you hear me or am I on mute? No, nope. good to I'm go. Good. OK, great. Thanks. Um, you know, we, we talk a lot about our products very frequently, but it's nice to be able to work with my colleagues and talk about things that are more than than just medicine. And that's something we're really investing in now. So what I want to do for just a few minutes um, is take a minute and look look at the different resources that uh, we have for an issue that's going on in veterinary medicine that's, you know, not totally unrelated from the topic tonight, and that, that is, you know, compassion, fatigue, and suicide. Um, as many of you know, it's probably touched many of you, it's touched me and, and my colleagues and friends, um, veterinary suicide rates are higher than any other profession. and um, it's basically 3.5 for men and 2.1 times the general population and, and growing. So we're, we're trying to do things that can help raise awareness and save lives. Um, so I'm going to go over some resources that exist for you and your veterinary staff. And then I'm going to show you a, a poster that we've developed that um, you will have access to through your BI rep if you'd like that. And the ones I'm going over here are really ones that um, you can look up yourselves. I'm going to provide the links. And I think, uh, Megan, at the end, you know, at some point, of course, you'll have the recording, but we'll also, you know, have these down for you um, as links that you can access. But, you know, feel free to write them down, jot them down, and you can access these websites. Um, for suicide prevention, some of them are veterinary specific, and some of them are not. And they're all very useful. So I'm going to just break them down arbitrarily with veterinary specific and then not specific um, and go through them. Um, the University of Tennessee actually has a veterinary social work program, and this is a number that you can call um, uh, for assistance with really uh, issues outside of suicide as well. Um, but you can also visit their website to learn more information there. I found that useful and um, it, it sort of uh, 
shines as a university driven uh, program. And then of course, there's always the state wellness programs. If you go state by state, the ABMA will list uh, this address here, the different places, uh, the different states and what, what programs they have available to you. So you can kind of link through there if you're not really exactly sure where to start or where to look for help for yourself or someone else. Then uh, you might have heard of uh, ASK by Banfield. ASK stands for uh, Ask, Support, No. Um, and that's basically a program they've started where you can go uh, and become certified in this technique of, of addressing potential uh, suicide cases and helping uh, with them and helping them find help um, because there are specific ways to address that and approach it. And if you're trained in it, you can really um, do a lot of good. So there's that. And then, um, I'll skip through that one because we kind of already talked about it. But then similar to that, AVMA has the QPR gatekeeper training, which is a different um, training you can do. It's not veterinary specific necessarily like the ASK program is, but it's very similar. And so um, that also is something you can do and become certified. And I believe they were doing a trial uh, where they would pay for a certain amount of people. Um, and I think that's still up and going. Not one more vet. I think many of you have probably heard of that. That's a great um, organization you can just join and, and stay up to date on, on the things that are happening and statistics and, and what we can do as a, as a community to help with this issue. Mighty Vet. Some of you here might actually be on Mighty Vet as mentors. This is a site where um, it's really aimed at mentorship for, for anyone who's looking for a mentor, but that's usually going to be new grads, of course, right? Um, but it's also something that can help with uh, suicide because when you have someone to talk to as a mentor uh, that really opens up the opportunity to broach those topics um, in a safe way. And then we do have the not veterinary specific options which of course you might have heard of and these are things that you know really are hotlines that anyone can call. Uh, it's someone to talk to who's really trained in these other QPR type um, certifications that can help with that. So you know, that's a lot of different resources. One of the things we've done, we put together a poster um, that you can actually get through your BI rep if you'd like. So if you don't know who your BI rep is, you can always contact me and I'll put my contact information at the end. Um, but this poster is something we really designed um, to go up in the, the, you know, the break room perhaps or somewhere where anyone could see it uh, and see resources and I've highlighted them, kind of zoomed in on them here select resources there. Of course, I've listed more out in, in the slide before because there are more, but these are some really core ones that veterinary staff and, and uh, doctors and techs and you know anyone really in the hospital could access. So if that's something that you want, uh, like I said, reach out to your Beringer Ingelheim sales manager or my contact, contact information is here, my phone number, my email. It's a lot of letters. <laughs> Good luck with that. Um, but we'll have it in the notes too, so you'll have that there. And just let them know that you're interested in the Compassion Fatigue poster that we put together and they'll make sure that you get some copies of that for your hospital. Um, so I, I wanna make sure I don't take up too much time and I'm gonna stop there. And uh, if you guys have any questions for me, I think you can use the Q&A or chat um, and then we'll just you know, kind of address those as we go through the lecture if I see them. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, thank you for the support to PVMA and for all your great messaging during this really difficult time. We would also like to wish you a very happy birthday. <laughs> um, and we're thank very you. thankful that you're spending your birthday with us, um, sharing this message and taking care of your recovering puppy from her <laughs> today. Yes, thank you. I told them earlier my, my dog was just spayed, so she's She's here beside me being recovered. You know, it's multitasking at its best. It's great to be here though, thank you. Thank you. Um, as a PVMA director and a CVT myself, I encourage everybody who is here tonight um, to look at um, supporting PVMA in any means possible, joining um, our association if you're not already a member and if you are a member thank you so much for supporting us we want to help continue serving the veterinary community during this really difficult time uh, for those of you who are not a member of PVMA uh, right now we do have prorated membership offers going for the rest of the year so feel free to hop over to our website pavma.org to see what's available uh, we're pleased to have with us tonight Dr. Sarah Wooten 
She has been making an impact in the veterinary world uh, throughout her career. She's been sharing what she's learned from small animal general practice um, through speaking internationally, writing numerous veterinary publications, and even creating a popular card game, Vets Against Insanity. We are pleased to have you here with us tonight to help us gather tools um, that we are able to help clients navigate this difficult time. Absolutely, I am so excited to be here. So, hey, uh, Nathaniel, could you stop sharing your screen so I could start sharing mine? That would be amazing. Yes, so, I just grabbed into the chat and forgot about that. Stop. That's okay. Okay, That's okay. stop Hi, share. Everybody, I see, I see you guys, and I am so thankful that you have taken time out of your busy day and your busy life to hang out with me for a little bit. And I hope that I have something of use to share with all of you that will help you um, in your day-to-day -day interactions with people, which right now is a little bit difficult. I'm just gonna put that out there. And so the title of this presentation is How to Deal with Unruly People. One of the other titles that we have found, I have had at one point was How to Deal with People That Suck but we are gonna just you know, dial that back a little bit and we're gonna just talk about how to deal with unruly people because literally, if, I don't know if you've noticed these days, but people are crazy, okay? So I am gonna try and keep my chat window open so I can see what you guys are saying and then keep my slides going as well. And oh, hi, Nicole, good to see you. I'm, I'm glad that you're here. Hi, Lloyd. Hi, everybody. Hi, Adam. I'm so glad. So please drop uh, just a, a hi um, that I'm here in the chat window, uh, the chat feature. If you don't know how to get to the chat feature, it's down at the bottom of your screen. You just press chat and then uh, you can kind of just give me some feedback. Megan's going to be monitoring that for me and letting me know if there's questions or concerns. Um, but I'm going to just kind of get us through this because listen up, people. I got a lot of slides. <laughs> so let's let's get into this. One thing I always like to know when I'm getting into something is what to expect, right? What, what am I in for for the next 90 minutes? Well, um, I want to share that with you. Um, so we're going to talk about unruly humans, right? Yes, we're all trained in animals, but tonight we are talking about the most difficult animal of all, the homo sapien sapiens, right? So if you're dealing with unruly behavior in your clinic, we're gonna talk about what's really going on, right? We're gonna talk about some calming strategy tools. Uh, then we're gonna talk about five ways to respond in challenging situations, because I guarantee you, if not tomorrow, maybe tonight when you get off this webinar and you deal with your family that you've been dealing with for weeks and weeks and weeks, you're gonna have challenging situations. And you need to be able to consciously control the only thing that you can control, which is you. Hi, Becky. Hi, Jessica. Hi, thank you so much for joining us tonight. I'm so glad um, to see you. And then we're, hopefully, I'm going to give you some inspiration, right? I'm gonna be throwing a lot of stuff at you, a lot of stuff, okay? So you're gonna to wanna to use it all, but I suggest just taking one or maybe two things and going back and applying it in your day-to-day -day life because this is all about practice, okay? We know we're in vet practice of veterinary medicine, right? We know we practice it and we know we're not perfect at it. Well, this is the same thing. You are gonna to learn to practice these things so that you can maybe change some of your behaviors so that your day-to-day -day interactions with all these crazy people that we're on the planet with right now become a little bit easier okay and then hopefully we're gonna have some fun because I like fun and more than ever we need some fun in our lives uh, I also utilize these veterinary confessional project uh, postcards and if you've been to a conference lately not lately because they're all canceled and we're all in quarantine but before that there was conferences and they had the veterinary confessionals project which was a project where veterinary professionals could come and write their deepest, darkest secrets on postcards for all the world to see. And this one says, had to call a dog's owner to tell her the dog threw up a red Victoria's Secret thong while boarding. The owner doesn't wear thongs. Well, could be a difficult conversation, could be an unruly human. I don't know. So you'll see these things pop up during this 
conversation. Also, normally when I, I do my presentations, man, if you've ever seen me, I got my hair all done and I got my makeup all done. Well, COVID-19, man, things are different. <laughs> I haven't done my hair back in a ponytail. There's no makeup. I'm wearing pajama pants, all for you, all for Pennsylvania. So love you guys. Hope you get something out of this presentation. Okay. So first of all, we're going to do some true or false. So I know I can't hear you, but if you're sitting and looking at this screen right now, just kind of answer these questions to yourself, or maybe, you know, throw a true or false in the chat window if you're feeling crazy, right? Okay. True or false. Clients can be overly emotional. True. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I see some true. I see some truths popping up. Okay. How about this one? Clients can be irrational. Maybe, maybe. Yes. How about clients can blame you for their problems? Oh, yep, I see, oh, oh, true, yeah, see that, okay. Managing employees can feel like adult babysitting, anyone? All oh, true, 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 okay, how about this one? People are fucking crazy right now, right? Sorry, BI, you hired me, you, know, you knew what you were in for. I am betting that some of you guys, when you're coming home from work, are this poor lady, right? Right? <laughs> And yes, you do. You are a hero. You are amazing. But at the same time, you have to be able to manage your own mental and emotional space so that you have something left over that is for you and not for everybody else. I know that the people who are listening, I know that we have a whole bunch of givers in here. And so today we're going to talk about how to care for you. Okay. So um, what I want you to do is I want you, as you're sitting here and thinking about this, Think about a situation that recently just really got under your skin, okay? That's why we have a picture of a scabies mite here, right? Something that just really irritated you and you just didn't do well with, right? So be thinking about what that is. And at the same time, I want you to be thinking about what are clients thinking and feeling when they take their pets to the vet, right? Because we know how we think and feel about it, but what are they thinking and feeling about it? Okay, so you got that situation. Normally, when I do, I do this presentation live, at this point I have a giant, a uh, giant piece of paper, and I'm writing down a whole bunch of things. And people are like, people who want services for free, people who don't want to, you know, vaccinate their pets, people who uh, think that you should drop everything and and give them the service right now, people who aren't obeying your curbside rules, people who dot, 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 right? Or you can also take this personal, right? You can say, my kids are driving me crazy and I was not a home, I'm not a homeschool mom, right? Or, oh my gosh, I can't believe what's going on. Just, just think of something, okay? But let's go back, okay? Let's go back to these clients. Let's go back to these people that are maybe giving us some crazies. So one situation that you could be running into in, in the veterinary clinic is a client that potentially acts like this. Okay, ready? Here comes a video. Hi, Mrs. Jones. We're taking care of Mr. Felix today. Don't worry, we're gonna take really good care of him. Here at the clinic, we practice low stress handling techniques, which means that we're gonna take our time and make him really comfortable. We actually spray this feline pheromone spray on a towel and put it over him to create a calming environment. And we actually can just leave the carrier open and let him come out when he's ready. Oh, no, 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 I got it. I'll, go, I'll get into Felix's house. Don't worry. No, we don't, no, we don't no, need that no, stuff. No, ma'am. Come no. on. We can no, talk really? to Felix. Mr. Felix, come on. Come on. It's a cat, not a martini. <sighs> Hi, I'm Dr. Wooten. Um, I'm going to be taking care of Felix. I'm just going to move this right now. And... Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to be examining your cat. So I'm going to touch your cat, okay? No, no, no. You don't need to. I will hold him for you. I'll hold. I got it. Okay. I got it. Okay. 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 okay then. So um, not recently because you don't have any clients in your hospital, but before. Think back before to all of this. Who has seen this client? Anybody ever seen this client? Anybody ever seen the client where you're like you literally have to unwrap the pet? The client from around the pet or you're trying to like listen to the clients or listen to the pet's heart and the client will not let go of the pet right i mean what is your initial response when you run into this in your day in and day out or some version of this right i mean could it be like this 
I don't know. I don't know. I know that I have had that response that you're seeing on Tina Fey's face more than the number of times that you could count it on your two hands, right? And the thing is, is I'm not alone. Every single time I've shown that video at conferences, people are like, yes, I have seen that person, right? In fact, there's so much of this going on in our profession that there was a postcard, there was a veterinary confessional postcard that said, I frequently wish that we could sedate unruly owners the same way we do their pets. Dex Dormitor for everyone, right? It's true. Yes, we have fractious dogs and cats and other animals, but sometimes the most fractious animal that you are dealing with in your day to day is not any of those. It's the one species that you're not licensed to treat, the Homo sapiens sapiens, right? And it can be enough to cause a lot of consternation and difficulty and just emotional turmoil for people who are dealing with the unreally human. So this this is all about learning though what is actually going on and when you learn what is actually going on it becomes a lot less scary and that I love this quote by uh, Mary Curie it says nothing in life is to be feared it is only to be understood now right now more than ever is the time to understand more so that we may fear less we need to understand what we're dealing with when we run into these people who are absolutely acting crazy. And I love this other quote by Albert Einstein. It says, we cannot solve our problems with the same thinking that we used when we created them, with the same mind, the same mindset, the same thoughts. We have to have an entirely new tool set of, of ways to deal with this behavior because it interferes with our ability to practice medicine effectively. It interferes with our ability to feel good at the end of the day. It interferes with our ability to be able to be good business owners. So we really have to get under the hood of what's going on with the homo sapiens sapiens that walk in to our clinics with all of their unruly behaviors. So to your average person, believe it or not, even though it's not scary to us at all, Vet clinics are scary, okay? People are anticipating that their pet is going to be in pain. They are afraid that they're gonna be separated from their pet. Now more than ever, when you take that pet away from them and they're sitting in the car and you go back inside and you have that pet and you're doing all your things to that pet, well, you've got that client sitting out in the car in a literal stew of craziness that they're probably maybe gonna project back onto you. They don't have any control right? And loss of control. Control is a basic human need. We love being in control. And when we're not, we behave really badly. They don't know what you're doing. As much as we try and educate them, they don't know. They often don't even know what you're doing when you just do a basic physical exam. But they don't know, right? And then underneath all of it is how much it's going to cost, right? They're afraid and sometimes they're ashamed if they are not able to pay for what their pet needs, right? Oh, and I see you guys in, I see, thank you, Becky. Thank you, Krista. Thank you uh, for saying that you've seen this before in your particular thing. I love seeing the chats come up, by the way. So say all the things that you want. I want to hear it all. Okay. So people, people are triggered. Okay. Clients that have a sick or injured pet or a financial limitation, they are experiencing literal, there's like a storm that is hovering above them about this high that you can't really see and it's filled with negative emotions furthermore if you're a human any neanderthals out there any homo erectus rectus no all, all homo sapiens sapiens all okay all right so if you're a human right now it's really hard okay people are triggered they just start even before they come to see you and so knowing that is really important. And the culprit is this guy down here. A lot of my uh, attendees now are actually becoming very knowledgeable about the, the structures that are inside the brain of the Homo sapiens sapiens. But that little red dot down there is the culprit. And that is taking over our species right now. And that little red guy is the amygdala. And that guy is in charge of your fight, flight, or freeze. They like to say it's in charge of the four F's of survival, right? Fight, flight, freeze, and reproduction. <laughs> I 
Okay, so basically what happens is when you have these people coming in that are already triggered, the blood flows away from their prefrontal cortex and their, all of their lovely uh, logical cortical functioning up there, and it, it diverts down into this amygdala. And this is the midbrain. This is the oldest part, one of the oldest parts of your brain. You have older parts down here, right? But this is your second oldest part, and you share this in common with every other mammal on the planet. And basically, when this little guy perceives any kind of threat in the environment, whether it is a tiger chasing you, or a unexpected bill in the mail, or a large veterinary bill, or, um, I don't know, a virus, or anything, or the economy crashing, or whatever, this amygdala goes, red alert, red alert, red alert, and it fires, and it goes crazy, and the person, the homo sapiens sapiens, stops being logical and goes into survival mind. It really, really sucks that we're designed that way. It has a couple of, of other names, right? It's called the lizard brain for good reason, because when it gets into uh, control of your nervous system, it makes you act less like a human and more like a lizard that's fighting for its life. I don't know if you've seen this, maybe in the people who are compiling still giant piles of toilet paper or whatever else that's going on out there. Um, lizard brain, lizard brain. It's also called your survival mind. It's got a lot of names and everything just gets worse when people don't understand what is going on or they lack the education to understand what you're doing. This postcard sums it up perfectly. It says, I think many of us forget what it was like to be an uneducated pet owner before the degree. It's so important to educate, not judge, right? Uh, this one says, also reminds us all that we are not we are not exempt. We are part of this human race. It says, when my own dog had an emergency, dehissed after surgery, I became the client from health. P.S. He did well. Okay. So you've got people freaked out. They are just freaked out and they're going to project it onto you, right? Then you also have things like caregiver burden. Uh, caregiver burden has been studied extensively in humans who are taking care of other sick humans. They have studies upon studies upon studies. And it's just now starting to be studied in human medicine, uh, in veterinary medicine by Mary Beth Spitznagel, who is out of Kent. And she, uh, she is publishing a series of papers that says that caregiver burden and owners of sick companion animals. And what she finds is that people who have pets that are chronically sick, they actually have a more difficult time with their psychosocial function. And this, um, actually, the study said that the chronic sickness of pets was linked to poor psychosocial functioning. This knowledge may help veterinarians understand and more effectively handle client distress in the context of managing the challenges of sick companion animal caregiving. This part's the funniest. Future work is needed to determine whether clients with this presentation impact veterinarian stress. Well, do you think it impacts our stress? I think it impacts our stress. So there's not only all the craziness that's going Thank you, Becky. There's not all the craziness that's going on with the COVID-19, but there's also caregiver burden involved, right? It's complicated, folks. Then we have this guy. Have you guys seen Maslow's uh, Hierarchy of Needs? This has been around since about the 1940s. And basically, this is this little pyramid reflects basic human needs and uh, what people need to feel good to be human, right? And at the very bottom, which is the widest, is your physiological needs, right? And so physiological needs are things like water and air and food and shelter and clothing. Um, and then after that comes your safety needs. So if you have all your physiological needs met, then you can address your safety needs, which are personal security, employment, health, resources, property, all of those things you need to feel safe. And then if you have all of that, then you can transition to the next one, which is love and belonging, friendship, intimacy, family, sense of connection. And then if you have that, then you can work on feeling a high self-esteem. Right? And then if you have that, then you can work on your self-actualization. 
Well, friends of the human race, we have a problem right now because we can't even meet the two bottom levels of what humans need to be able to function normally. Okay, and so what you're seeing is absolute horrible behavior because people's basic needs are not being met, right? Now, this is short term, this is not long term, but knowing this is going to give you Jedi level skills in dealing with people. Because if you understand that their bad behavior has nothing to do with you and everything to do with not feeling safe, that changes everything, right? So when you're dealing with this, and I know you're dealing with this, I know you're dealing with it every freaking day, you have to remember that actually you're dealing with this, okay? And we have to remember, I, I wish veterinarians were trained like nurses, firefighters, and paramedics, that we are basically first responders and we serve people in crisis. Furthermore, people are not haters, okay? They are afraid and they are projecting their insecurity onto the closest willing target, which is often a caring, compassionate veterinary professional. So I'm sorry that that happens to you, but really it has nothing to do with you and everything to do with how afraid they are. And I love this quote. It says, um, why are you so nice even to people who are rude? And it says, because I too have been rude to nice people. And I know that rudeness comes from a, a place of roaring pain and only kindness suits it. And that is so true, right? You can diffuse the craziest human behavior with some kindness. But in the meantime, now we know that we're dealing with fearful humans. And so what do you do with a fearful human? Well, you have to brace yourself. And I love Game of Thrones, by the way. I would love to put a lot more Game of Thrones in my presentations, but this is all I have for today. So brace yourselves and understand fear behaviors in Homo sapiens sapiens, because literally you are surrounded by it right now, right? You may even be feeling it right now in yourself, okay? So some of these slides were like pre-COVID-19, so they have to do with face-to-face which may not be relevant right now, but we're gonna go with it, okay? So we're gonna talk about fight, flight, or freeze behaviors in Homo sapiens sapiens, okay? So let's talk about flight responses first, okay? People are not being rude. They are emotionally hijacked by their amygdala and they are exhibiting patterned behavior that you just need to recognize, okay? So flight responses, maybe the person gets defensive, Maybe they become overly guarded. Maybe they're ignoring or avoiding issues that you're bringing up. Maybe they're trying to smooth over conflict or placate to keep things under control or minimizing or downplaying the issue. Maybe the conversation looks something like, Mrs. Jones, your dog's teeth are falling out of its head and you need to have a dental plus extractions. And the client goes, no, 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 Fluffy's fine, okay? Client's not being a jerk, maybe client might be in a flight response. More flight responses, shuts down, disengages from the conversation, uses humor or jokes to deflect or change the subject. Maybe pretends to agree to avoid conflict or uses crying to distract and not engaged, okay? Knowing that you are dealing with a human that has been emotionally hijacked by their amygdala and is in a flight response and not just being a jerk, is a tool that you can keep in your tool belt, okay? Now there's also freeze responses, okay? Freeze responses happen in Homo sapiens sapiens, okay? So maybe your person that you're talking to is blanking out and doesn't remember what they want to say and then emails you a half an hour later and wants to tell you everything and you're like, oh my God, I just spent all this time. Well, maybe they're in a freeze response. Maybe they're zoning out, not listening to what you're saying. Maybe they're not responding to you at all. Maybe they're acting overly anxious and scared. Maybe, just maybe, they're staring at their phone instead of listening to you. I saw that one a lot and I just thought, oh my gosh, that person is being so rude. But actually maybe that person is just in a freeze response and literally cannot cognitively process what you're giving to them right now. 
Sometimes people who are in uh, freeze responses look like this, right? <laughs> oh, I don't want to pick on the poor cat. <clears throat> okay. So, oh, Becky, it's not you most days. Girlfriend, you're going to be good. Okay. Thank you for engaging on the chat. All right. So let's talk about, so flight responses, freeze responses. Let's talk about the one that just really, oh, really gets at us and really fires us, us up. Okay. We've got the fight responses. The jerk. Okay. So fight responses can look like this. And you may be seeing a lot of this in your life right now. Aggressively argues, attacks, or debates raises their voice at you, tries to silence you, tries to win at any cost, interrupts you, maybe they're arrogant or condescending, or maybe they're just dismiss what you say altogether, or maybe they explode and they direct their feelings onto somebody else. Fight responses, very unruly, very, very difficult to deal with. And there's more, okay? People can be intimidating to you or they can be sarcastic and belittling. And this is not just clients, friends. This could be your staff. You could be seeing these behaviors in your staff towards each other, right? Technicians that are dip, 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 dip back at each other or doctors or whoever, right? Tries to embarrass others. Terrible. Criticizes or accuses others or bullies others into submission or the worst, turns your words against you. These behaviors are awful and you're probably running into them on a daily basis. And it is so, so helpful to know that these people that you're dealing with are probably emotionally hijacked, terrified out of their minds, and probably really nice people when they're not emotionally hijacked by their amygdala, okay? The challenge with this, my friends, is that you have these little things in your mind, in your brain called mirror neurons, and it makes it really, really hard to not get caught up in the drama, okay? So mirror neurons are these amazing little neurons that we have in our brains, and they are amazing for helping us build society and be able to understand each other. And the basic gist is, if you have somebody with an arm's length, which is probably not very many people right now, but if you do have somebody with an arm's length, and you make an emotion at them. You smile, frown, cry, you do anything. They are very likely to mirror that emotion right back to you. So if you have a client that's just frowning at you, and angry, that's gonna stir up your own mirror neurons and it's gonna make you mirror that right back to them. More than that, that's gonna make you mirror that back to your staff. Maybe it makes you mirror it back to your family and it's something that can really trip you up unless you know what's going on physiologically in your brain, okay? So the first step to this is awareness, which is what we're doing right now. We're just talking about awareness and understanding the underlying cause beneath the behaviors, okay? So awareness is one tool that you are going to have in your tool belt. And you are going to be able to utilize something called noting. I don't know if anybody is into Zen Buddhist meditation. I am. Um, but there is a technique called noting. And basically, it's something that you do inside yourself. So if you notice when you're around another homo sapien sapien, a client, a staff member, a husband, a wife, a partner, whatever, a child, and you notice one of those bad behaviors that we just already talked about. Well, instead of going, that person is such a jerk, you can go in your mind, don't say it out loud, don't say it out loud. You can go, oh, well, that's interesting. What, what is that behavior? Oh, that's fear. Oh my God. And then that gets you to the next level. So when you're running into this behavior and hey, by the way, you're gonna run into it tonight or tomorrow or the next day, Instead of just getting sucked into that immediately, you can go, oh, ooh, fear, right? Don't do it out loud. Do it in your mind. It doesn't work if you do it out loud, okay? So noting is the first technique because what that does is that sucks you, it pulls you out of your own emotional reaction and allows you to reach for other tools that are in your tool belt, okay? 
So once you recognize the behavior, the next thing you can do is you can reach for your authentic, empathetic statements. Empathetic statements, it is proven in science and because we're all scientists here. Empathetic statements can reduce unproductive reactions during difficult triggering situations. Okay, so you've got somebody who's coming in there, they're fully like, oh my God, I'm freaking out, you know? You can totally diffuse that because you are that powerful. You can say, hi there, I'm Dr. Wooten. How are you doing today? I used to use that, I've been out of practice for two years now, practice for 16 years. I used to use that all the time, especially when I walked into an exam room or I was talking to a client that I knew that they were already emotionally hijacked. I'd go, how are you today? And the client would go, oh, 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 and because they were not expecting that. And then they go, well, actually, I'm not doing well, you know? And then they would tell me something, and then I'd go, oh, gosh, that's really hard. Okay, how can I help you? And I can't tell you how many times people that I saw and I cared for their pets, they said, they said, you know, no one's ever asked me that before when I went to a veterinary hospital, and I am so thankful that you said, asked me that today, because it shows that you care. And friends, people will not, especially emo emotionally hijacked people, will not care how much you know until they know how much you care. And so you can just say, how are you doing today? Spend two to three minutes listening to that person, changes everything, right? Backs them off the emotional truck, gets things a little bit more level. Sometimes I use humor, right? I had a hemorrhagic enteritis come in and the dog was literally crapping blood all the way down the hallway. And the client's running after the, after the dog with a little tissue. And I'm like, oh, oh, yeah. I'm sure this is what you wanted to do today, right? <laughs> and they laugh and I laugh. Laughter is a diffuser, right? You know, sometimes just saying, this is really hard. This is hard. I am so sorry, right? Um, or I understand that you're worried. If I were you, I love the statement, if I were you, if I were you, I would be worried too, okay? We're gonna do everything we can. So you got your awareness, you got your empathetic statement, now your unruly human that you're dealing with is a little bit more under control, okay? The next thing that you can do, you can try to meet the need for certainty, which is not being met for anybody right now on this planet, right? And you can see what happens to humans when our need for certainty gets not met. We all behave like ra raving lunatics, right? So humans don't not like not knowing what's going on and what to expect. It makes us feel very anxious and very unsafe. And a lot of people are feeling like that constantly. So we even prefer to know bad things are about to happen rather than be in the dark. So the more that you can be upfront and transparent as much as possible about everything, the more you're going to meet this need and the more you're unruly really human that you're dealing with is going to calm down. The other basic human need that's not being met on this planet right now is this need for autonomy. Okay, we, we like to choose and be in control of what's happening to our lives. By extension, people like to choose and be in control of what is happening to their pets, okay? So the more you can give people that opportunity and option to be in control and choose what's going to happen, the less likely this basic human need is going to be threatened, okay? And it, you can take it down to very low levels. You can, I always use the example of how I used to deal with my kids when they were little. And I would say, would you like to clean your room now or would you like to clean it in 10 minutes? And then that little person has their need for autonomy met when they get to choose which one they want, but the room still gets clean. Does that make sense? So you use a little bit of psychology, you give them some options and that need for autonomy backs off and you get a little less reactive behavior from that client. So, Think about ways that you can be creative about meeting this need, okay? And then lastly, body language. Yeah, I'm not sure how much this slide is relevant right now, but it will be again pretty, pretty soon. Um, if you smile at a client and you're wearing a mask, no one's gonna see that, but they might see it in your eyes. So eye contact, smiling, mirroring their behaviors, 
reflecting back what they're saying to you. All of those things can really help to settle that person down enough to where they can stop diverting blood to that amygdala and stop feeling threatened in their mind. And they can instead get their blood and their activity back and their higher cortical functioning so that they can have a normal cognitive conversation with you. You wanna be talking to their upper cortices. You don't wanna be talking to their amygdala because you're gonna lose every time, okay? That amygdala needs to go back to sleep, okay? So those are a couple of tools that you can use when, and it's not if, it's when at this point because you're gonna walk out your front door and run into a reactive human, okay? These are the tools you can use to calm that other human down. And in doing that, you're gonna actually not only make your life easier, but you're gonna make their life easier as well because face it, friends, emotions are as contagious as viruses and you can be emotionally positive or emotionally negative, okay? That's your choice. And so when we think about, so, okay, so we talked about the clients, right? We know what's going on with the clients. It's pretty easy. You see those behaviors, you note it in your mind, you reach for your tool belt, you know what to do. What's a little bit harder is managing ourselves. And managing ourselves is actually the most important work I think that we're all being called to right now because it's hard, especially when everything in your external environment is telling you that you need to be freaked out and you need to be reactive and you need to be this and you need to be that. But you have choices. And so that's what we're going to talk about on the second part of this webinar. And I love, love, love this guy, Viktor Frankl. Um, he was a neuropsychologist. He was an author. He was a brilliant person and he was a Holocaust survivor. So he went through the Holocaust, right? Reactive people everywhere, crazy. And he says this, everything, everything can be taken from you. But one thing, one thing, the last of the human freedoms, and that's your ability to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances and to choose your own way. So that's what we're gonna talk about next. And this is where I'm really gonna give you the superpowers, the super levels, and the things that are going to make things different for you than they were before, okay? So the second half of this is all about five ways to respond to difficult situations and people, okay? We are in a difficult situation. There's no getting around it. And in that difficult situation, there's a lot of difficult people, okay? And we, believe it or not, have a choice about the way that we respond. So I hope you've been thinking a little bit about that difficult situation that I had talked about at the beginning of the webinar. If you're just jo joining us, welcome. Um, what I want you to do is I want you to be thinking about it. And if you have a little piece of paper or pencil, that's great too. Write down um, just a re recent situation for you that has been triggering, okay? so. It can be personal, it can be professional, it can be whatever you want, but something that just kind of made you not happy. And then think about, about the way that you responded in it, okay? And I think the example that I'm gonna use is, um, I'm really neurotic about my kids, my, my family leaving socks around the house. It just drives me crazy. I don't know what it is, but it just drives me crazy. So that's gonna be my situation. Pick anything you want. It's a game, right? It's all a game. So I'm gonna talk about in any situation that you're gonna deal with, any situation, doesn't matter what it is, there are five ways that you could choose to respond. And the different ways that you choose to respond have different outcomes, okay? So, and I, I use dogs because obviously we're all veterinary professionals and we see a lot of dogs and I think we really relate to that. So the first one I wanted to go over is this guy, the attack dog. Attack dog, I picked a chihuahua uh, because man, I'll tell you what, I have had the worst bites from chihuahuas than anything else on the planet, okay? So uh, attack dog, this response can look like this, okay, ready? 
Where's that CBC? I needed it five minutes ago. Hey, you know what? Get off my back. Okay. I'm, I'm really, really not having a good day. Get off my back. Or, you know what? I am up to here with it already. Or can you believe the nerve of that client? Or what a bitch. Okay. There's lots and lots and lots and lots of ways to show up as an attack dog in difficult situations. The attack dog is an automatic stimulus response. Stimulus happens, something makes us angry, we have a response. It just happens. And it is, comes from the most primitive part of our brain, that amygdala. And our amygdala reaches for it automatically in situations where we feel threatened on or attacked on any level. It is a survival mode reaction. And the part of your brain that runs this reaction doesn't know the difference between an actual physical attack, like from a shark, or an emotional or mental attack coming from a client or a coworker. It can't tell the difference at all, but it has the same response. It's quick mo moving. It is emotionally loaded. And my friends, it's where we misbehave the most. In this reaction, we want to blame others, we want to complain, and we want to punish. And I am not throwing, I am not judging anybody right now because I'll tell you what, since this whole thing has gone down, I have been an attack dog more than I would like to admit, right? Attack dog uses judgment of others as literally a subconscious self-defense mechanism. This is how your brain works. Crazy. Attack dog can also operate in really subtle ways. If you get reactive or you feel defensive or you feel angry or you feel slighted or you feel in fill in the blank negative emotion, but you don't do anything on the outside, you're still in attack dog on the inside. It's crazy, right? I love this little picture, me on my way to overreact. <laughs> right, I feel super self-justified. I am angry, I'm gonna go do something, right? Whatever is happening in this situation is definitely the other person's fault. When I'm an attack dog, me, I'm an attack dog, my mind is so busy telling itself these stories that the other person is the problem. And so aggressive attack dog thinking can sound something like, it's because this other person did this that I feel this, right? It's taking all of your emotions and your emotional powers and the way you feel and it's taking out it's taking that out of your own power and it's putting it in the other person's hands it's basically giving away your power so when you're an attack dog it results in separation rather than connection and that's what the attack dog functions to do separate you from that perceived threat and so I want to ask you, in what situations do you feel like you act like the attack dog? Try to remember the last situation where your attack dog came out. How often is your response the attack dog? How does the attack dog influence your life and your relationships? And if the attack dog is out, it's a good time to ask yourself, if you can, and we'll get to that, is my ego in check? Is this how I want to behave? Is this how I want to show up in this situation? It's really, really, really hard to do when you're actually in the response because you yourself have been emotionally hijacked. But I'm telling you, there is a way to make different cho choices in the situation and you have that power. Okay, so that's dog number one, the attack dog. Urgh. Oh, it's so weird to be talking to myself in a room, but I'm gonna keep going. Okay, next dog is this guy, the self-doubt dog. Oh, Sophia, I've lived, oh honey, I hear you. Girlfriend, thank you so much for being authentic and sharing. That is so, so, I mean, it's so true. Like I find myself like, oh, I'm totally good. Arr, attack dog, you know? And it's like, it, it happens so quickly, right? So we're gonna get to ways on how to calm your attack dog and literally get to a different emotional space. 
But let's talk about self-doubt dog, okay? I've never, literally never met an Italian greyhound that believes in himself ever, right? Okay, so the self-doubt dog is very, very similar to the attack dog response. But instead of attacking others, you turn the attack on yourself. So in a triggering situation, whatever it is, instead of attacking somebody else, you judge and you criticize yourself and you dwell on your own unworthiness. Literally, this response amounts to being violent towards yourself, to hating yourself, to self-hatred. And I'll tell you what, I, I feel like I see this so much in our profession. Beautiful souls that are out there making a difference and doing amazing things and all they can do is criticize themselves and it just it breaks my heart right so literally when we're choosing this response we're not believing in ourselves at all and the internal dialogue um, sounds something like this okay you ready I am not smart enough I can't do this I am not capable I'm really not worth it uh, we are afraid of being rejected we're afraid of disappointing others. We're afraid of failing. We're afraid, right? So this type of negative self-talk. Oh, Sophia, did you read my diary? <laughs> oh, honey, love you. Hugs, okay? We will get through this. Okay, sorry, I'm reading the chat. Okay, so let's go back to um, our triggering situations and ask yourself the following. Self-doubt dog follows immediately after our yeah follows immediately after my brief attack dog response. Thank you, Becky. It's so true, right? You like you go out and you're like, oh, I'm angry. I'm gonna yell at you, and then you walk away and you're like, oh, I feel bad. Now I hate myself. Oh my gosh, it's this vis vicious cycle. But we can get out of it, okay? So when you're thinking about the self-doubt dog, ask yourself, how often do I behave as the self-doubt dog? Does it serve me? to behave as a self-doubt dog? Does it serve others? Does it serve my patients to behave as a self-dog? Self-doubt dog? What are my fears in this scenario? What happens around me when I start doubting myself? And then, um, how would these situations be different if I believed in myself? Big questions, right? Uh, so much love to all you guys. I'm so glad that you're here. Okay, so the attack dog. Here's our first two dogs, the attack dog and the self-doubt dog. They are unfortunately the most common automatic responses that homo sapiens sapiens reach for in any difficult situation because they are automatic. They are designed to protect ourselves. Our brains are wired this way. So we perceive a threat and we err uh, or we err, uh, right? Because our lizard brain takes over. And the thing is, is like, once you realize that you're doing it, you can make it worse by actually beating yourself up for having those reactions. So my exhortation to anybody listening right now is if you find yourself an attack dog or self doubt dog, a lot of the time. Let's all take a breath. You're normal. Okay. You have to learn to forgive yourselves for the things that you did when you are in survival mode. Okay. If you don't know what you're doing, you're doing the best you can. And if you find yourself reaching for these reactions, you got to really be kind to yourself and you got to be gentle because literally you're meeting parts of yourself that you have been at war with. And so it's really, really important when you find yourself in an attack dog to not immediately turn the attack on yourself because that's just going to make it worse. Instead, you're going to go, oh, you know what? I just don't want to do that anymore. I think I'm going to do something different. So let's talk about different things that you can do, okay? All right, so in order to get out of these responses and choose something different, it requires interrupting the reactive neural pathways that you have built in your brain, okay? So you've got these reactive pathways, what are you gonna do with them, right? So 
to get out of attack dog or self doubt dog, it looks something like this. The pause button. It looks like a big breath. Let's just breathe together again. I know you're all here. I know you're all hanging out. So we're going to take a breath together. Okay, ready? Okay. So you have the stimulus, whatever it is that makes you to go into attack dog or self dog. And instead of choosing that, you're going to take a breath and you're going to count to 10. One, two, three, four, five, and on and on. And that pause is necessary to stop your brain from going down, tripping on down the same pathway. Okay. In the heat of the moment, when you're hearing words or seeing things that are pressing your buttons and stirring up all those old stories in you, it is really hard to hit the pause button. It's really, really hard. Like I find myself all the time just, who left this sock? I am so mad about this sock. And I don't pause. And I'm, I rant about the sock and then I walk away and I go, I really didn't want to rant about the sock, but here I was, okay? So pausing is something that you have to practice. Just like veterinary medicine, you got to practice it. You probably won't get it the first time. I'm just putting that out there. Probably not going to get it. Maybe you will. That would be awesome, but you probably won't. You may not get it the 10th time, but if you set your intention to implement it at some point, you will notice, you know what? I, I just don't want to do this anymore. Oh my God, I'm going to hit the pause button, right? Sometimes I'll be in the mid rant about a sock. Who left this sock? And then I'll just stop. And I've hit the pause button, right? So it may be after you're an attack dog or self dog, you may be already in a reaction when you wake up and remember that you don't want to do that anymore and you want to hit the pause button and you just stop. And that's okay, all right? It's even okay if you notice it after the fact because you're rewiring your brain to have different responses. Just don't beat yourself up when you don't hit the pause button. This is a process, it's, an, it's a journey, okay? And when you hit the pause button, guess what you get access to? Another dog, yeah you do! The watch and wait dog comes up. So another response, congratulations, you did it, you paused. You get the watch and wait dog. Watch and wait dog is magical, right? Because it momentarily puts you on hold. It keeps you from having some sort of reaction. It helps you catch yourself before you slip back into the negativity. It's like this place of magical suspension between stimulus, whatever it is, and whatever response you want, right? The watch and wait dog is the most important dog in this process because it's where you literally neutralize all that negative energy that's surfing up in you. And it's the dog of choice to attack dog or not to attack dog, right? It um, this watch and wait dog represents your responsibility in this moment, in the truest sense of the world, your ability to respond instead of react, your response ability. You see what I did there? So when you're in the watch and wait dog, um, you may need to physically remove yourself from a situation, okay? You may need to go for a walk and calm yourself back down so that you can get back in and provide the most compassionate, logical care that you can. So maybe it's a five minute walk outside. Watch and wait dog just keeps thinking about what made attack dog mad in the first place and gets mad again. <laughs> oh, Gani, you're hilarious. <laughs> no, okay, yeah, watch and wait dog could, right? So you got your stimulus. Oh, I'm so angry. Yes, I want to be mad. I want to be so mad, right? Or you could think about that that negative emotion in you is making you feel bad and it's literally actually punishing yourself and that you want to choose something that feels a little bit better because you deserve to feel better, okay? So you may need to go for a walk, five minutes, okay? The veterinary hospital will not burn down in five minutes if you go outside and you walk. The other superpower here, my friends, breath work, 
okay? Breath is one of the most important things that you can learn to control within this physical meat skeleton that you drive around. When you control your breathing and you slow down your heart rate and you slow down those survival chemicals that are surfing around your body, then your amygdala thinks, oh, threat's gone. Whether the threat is a scary surgery or a pissed off client, whatever, if you breathe in the right way, your amygdala goes, eh, there's nothing going on. Calms down and you can regain use of your higher cortical functioning. Okay, so we're gonna do a, a quick, we're gonna do a little breathing exercise. Okay, I have um, on this slide, you see a bunch of Navy SEALs. Navy SEALs actually literally go into life or death situations all the time. And if they lose access to their <laughs> higher cortical functioning, they can die, okay? So they have to control their amygdala with their breath. And they do it with something called box breathing. And box breathing, I'm not going to demonstrate for you today because you can Google it. And if you don't know what you're doing, you can actually maybe make yourself pass out. And I don't think BIVI would be very happy if I made some of their attendees pass out. But Google it because if you practice box breathing for 45 seconds to about a minute and a half, that's all it takes to shut down those catecholamine cascades, slow your heart rate, get a vagal maneuver going, and then you're back in control, right? Oh, I love Nicole. I have an inhale, exhale sign on my locker. <sighs> breathing. I've had clients literally screaming in my face and I am practicing a breathing exercise they don't even know. And I am keeping my, myself under control and not getting sucked into what they're doing. Okay. I also have 4-8 breathing listed on this slide. 4-8 breathing is when you inhale for a count of four and you exhale for a count of eight. When your exhale is longer than your inhale, it sends signals to this body to calm the fuck down, okay? You can also just do 4-4 four, four breathing. That's your inhales match your exhales. Your ins match your outs. Very simple. Even something like that can really calm yourself down. So if you find that you're getting heat up about something, whatever it is, you can go, ah, I'm going to pick the watch and wait dog and I'm going to breathe. There's a reason why our systems, when we are relieved about something, we go, oh, oh, we do it automatically. Or when we're nervous about something, we go, oh. well, when you do that, you send signals to this body that you're driving around. And so you want to send the right signals in order to calm things down, okay? So, are you doing your breathing right now? Let's do it together. Let's go, inhale, two, three, four. Hold it for two, two, exhale. And you're alone in your house right now. You can be silly, you can go, and when you do that at your veterinary hospital, your, your staff's gonna be like, what are you doing? You're gonna be like, I'm breathing, I'm calming myself down, and maybe they'll start doing it too, okay? So, 4-8, advanced yoga style, yes, definitely. Um, you wanna be sitting down when you're using it because you could pass out, okay? So breath work, my friends, you will tap into some amazing superpowers when you utilize your breath in the right way. When people are stressed, Can asthmatics or COPD patients do all these breathing exercises? Fabulous question. They can do it to the best of their ability. So if you have a COPD patient who is not able to exhale fully, then they can do the best they can. But the important thing is to be relaxed when you're doing it. It's really important to be relaxed. Asthmatics can absolutely 100% utilize these breath, this breath work exercise to actually calm their system down, to be able to, because a lot of times asthma attacks are actually made worse by anxiety. So if you utilize the breathing, the breath work, it's amazing, okay? All right, enough on the breath work. I'm gonna move on. The next dog you gain access to after you've watched and you've waited and you've breathed and you're like, mm, okay, 
I'm zen, I know what I'm doing, is the assertive dog. And I picked a French bulldog because these guys are cute AF and they always seem to get their way and they never make anybody mad about it. Um, yeah, so once you're the watch and wait dog, you can begin the detective work of understanding what's going on inside of you. And so the sort of dog is where you become very self-aware. You know who you are, what you want, and where you are going. And you're not afraid to speak your truth firmly and kindly. <laughs> so it sounds like you keep unlocking the next Pokemon evolution. Definitely that's what we're doing. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. In this response, in the assertive dog, we also create the boundaries, right? Where we do not give our power away. We're not going to give our emotional response away. That's ours to control, right? This person could be over here freaking out and doing whatever they're doing. I'm breathing. <sighs> okay. We've become assertive, but we're not aggressive. And we look after ourselves in this response and here we grow and here we become free and powerful okay and I always love this slide because I think sometimes it's a good opportunity to have a reminder about the differences in behavior assertive is not aggressive and so assertive appropriately honest direct self-enhancing expressive self-confident empathetic to the emotions of all involved Oh yes, Mrs. Jones, I can see that you're having a hard time. I really empathize with you. I am not gonna join you in your drama, right? Versus aggressive, which is where we're at a lot of the times right now, inappropriately honest. That, that sounds like this. You know what, I'm just gonna be honest here, but dot, 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 here is something I don't like about you, right? Direct, expressive, attacking, blaming, controlling, self-enhancing at the expense of others. See the difference? A lot of us live in passive aggressive, or we know people who live in passive aggressive, emotionally dishonest. Oh yeah, I'm fine, I'm fine, no, I'm not fine. I'm gonna talk about you behind your back, right? <laughs> self-denying at first, self-enhancing at the expense of others later, okay? Assertive, different than those other ones. So when negative feelings arise in you, when you come into a difficult situation, you have this negative feeling coming up. It's okay. It's fine. It's a signal that some need that you have is not being met. Anger can result from a need for respect or understanding. Fear can result or reflect a need for reassurance and safety, right? So the work of the assertive dog, if you choose this, is identifying the feelings that are coming up in you as you react to the trigger and discovering what needs in you are not being met, okay? So, when you are in the assertive dog, um, you could utilize nonviolent communication techniques. Uh, anybody familiar with nonviolent communication? Uh, it's a wonderful book filled with a lot of communication techniques that are in there, and it's a really great tool to utilize if you are expressing yourself. So, for example, let's go back to my socks. Normally, I'd be an attack dog. Hey, who's leaving these socks out? I'm pissed off. I already talked about these socks. Put the socks away. You hate me. Da 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 da. Right? Fill in the attack dog response. Where I could utilize this nonviolent communication tool here. So, nonviolent communication. You have to refer to a specific situation. So, first, obviously you observe. When I see the socks laying all over the house, or when I saw the socks laying around the house this afternoon, it made me feel stressed because I need order in my environment in order to feel calm. And then you add in a request. Would you be willing to pick up your socks? So you can utilize this in any way. So, Mrs. Jones, when you're yelling at me about Fluffy's toenail trim, it makes me feel upset, sad, whatever, fill in the blank negative, because I need to be able to communicate logically with you. Would you be willing to stop yelling, fill in the blank situation that you're using, okay? 
in order to be able to utilize the nonviolent communication techniques, you have to be able to understand the feelings that are coming up in you. And so many of us have pushed our feelings away for so long that we don't even know. So it's important to know what is getting triggered into you, in you, and what your needs are. Did you feel powerless? Did you feel disrespected? Did you feel judged? Did you feel trapped? Did you feel frustrated? Did you feel forgotten? Did you feel unsafe, right? It's important for you to understand what is going on inside of you so that you can ask something of the other person. So knowing, knowing that this tool out there exists, it's called nonviolent communication, can absolutely 100% facilitate conversations in a way that is assertive, honoring your boundaries and honoring your own emotional space, okay? All right, the last dog, this guy, it's the empathetic dog, and I picked the golden retriever because they're the best. Empathetic dog, this is your highest choice in any situation, and you can choose it even if somebody's being a jerk right to your face, okay? So empathetic dog, displays empathy, compassion, and understanding. This is, when we choose this response, we're literally putting our egos over there, put your ego over there, and we're listening to people, and we're caring for them. Because we know that we're good inside, right? We know that we're good inside. This is where we're literally stepping into the shoes of another person. And this is where we connect with other people. And so the empathetic dog asks questions like, Am I respecting that other person's boundary? How can I meet the needs of the other? Now remember, you cannot pour from an empty cup, okay? If you are feeling like your cup is just empty, your cup is empty, you gotta fill your own cup up before you can choose the empathetic dog response. So meet your own needs. Literally, it's like when you're flying on a plane and they say, put your own oxygen mask on you before you put it on others. Veterinary professionals are so empathetic and so caring. We often put the oxygen mask on everybody else at the expense of our own. In order to reach this highest choice, you've got to fill your own cup up first, okay? So you can utilize the nonviolent communication technique for the empathetic dog as well. So if you have somebody who's freaking out, if you have a staff member who's freaking out or, or being mean or reactive or you have a client or whatever, you can say, hey, hey there, you know, technician Sally. I noticed when you yelled at technician Jenny, I noticed that. Um, are you feeling okay? Um, is there something that you need? Would you like? How can I help you, right? This is, this is, this is the absolute highest choice of human beings. This is where we are our most beautiful in relationship to others and relationship to ourselves. And so you may be sitting there and thinking, there is absolutely no way I can ever get to this because I am freaking in between attack dog and self-doubt dog, and I don't even know how to get here, right? So it's a practice and it's a journey. And it's really, really, really important to not beat yourself up if you don't feel like you can reach this response right now. And it's really important to care for yourself. And it's really important to be self-aware of where you are. And so I want to give you one more tool that you could potentially use to walk yourself up away from the attack dog and the self dog to higher choices. And it's this guy. It's the emotional guidance scale. <clears throat> yeah, a little hippy dippy woo woo, but I'm just gonna go. I'm gonna go with it because desperate times, friends, okay? So if you are down at number 20, oh, thanks, Dr. Nathaniel. I'm going for it, right? Okay, so if you are finding yourself down on the downward spiral, on the right, down at the bottom, and you're in fear, or you're feeling powerless, or you're feeling insecure, or you're feeling rage, or all of those other completely natural human feelings that you are 100% entitled to feel and are very normal, well, it's gonna be very difficult to get to the upward spiral, the top of the other side, right? The joy, the knowledge, the empowerment, the freedom, the love, the you're not gonna just, I mean, unless you're somebody crazy and much more skilled than I am, you're not gonna get from fear, grief, depression to joy, knowledge, empowerment, freedom. 
you're not, right? And a lot of people will beat themselves up for not being able to do that. I am telling you to not do that. But if you could choose one feeling that feels just a little bit better, just a little bit better. So maybe you're in fear, but then you move to discouragement. Well, believe it or not, that's closer to joy than fear, okay? So in any situation, if you are feeling these big negative emotions, challenge yourself to choose something that feels just a little bit better and don't judge yourself for whatever that is, okay? Oh, thank you. No one ever gives me permission to actually feel how I feel. Oh, I love that, Sophia. Thank you so much for sharing. No, it's true. Okay, so there's been so many times where I've just beat myself up because I'm like, I'm not in joy. I'm just not in joy. I'm just over here in discouragement or worry, right? Because that's my thing. So instead, I'm like, okay, here I am in worry. I'm going to move to frustration or boredom. You know, one of the things I find that helps most for me is if I'm in a negative motion, can I at least get myself to neutral? Can I at least get to neutral? If I can get to neutral, man, good job, Sarah, right? So yes, my therapist always asks me, what would it take to move me up the scale? So whatever it takes to move you up that scale, just one, one click, one click, that's all you need. You don't need to go over to optimism or positive expectation. If you move yourself up one click, then the next time you can move yourself up another click and then you can move yourself up another click. And then suddenly you find that your baseline has shifted and you're like, I'm so positive. I don't even know what the heck is going on with me. It's crazy, right? It's a practice. It's like veterinary medicine is a practice. So if you can remember this little guidance scale when you are, you know, in some sort of negative emotion. Uh, emotion, right? Maybe you're in overwhelmment. Man, I'm in overwhelmment a lot right now. If you could get out of that, move into boredom. Hey, guess what? Good job, you. Okay. So utilize the emotional guidance scale. Choose a thought or a feeling that just feels just a little bit better and you're going to be doing better. Okay. All right. So a couple, uh, couple of things. Just because some people are fueled by drama doesn't mean you have to attend the performance, okay? You don't have to get sucked in. Golden Retriever, easiest response. What can I do for you as an opening? Beautiful, beautiful, Scott. Thank you for sharing. And these are your three higher choices that you could choose. You got your watch and wait dog. You got your assertive dog. You got your Golden Retriever, okay? You got all these guys and they are all available to you all the time. Okay, so here is all five. Got your tack dog, your self dap dog, your watch and wait dog, your sort of dog, and your golden retriever. And what I want to ask yourself is where do you spend your day? Which dog are you? Where do you spend most of your day? If it's the attack dog or the self doubt dog, can you forgive yourself for doing what you had to do in survival mind and then learn to choose a different response? If you are in uh, attack dog or self-doubt dog, what is something you can do to get from attack or self-doubt to watch and wait? Maybe it's your breath work, okay? Maybe you pick up a new breathing skill. I'm thinking back to Maslow's hierarchy of needs, that pyramid, right? If you are in attack dog or survival dog most of the time, how can you meet some of your own needs so that you can reach for more productive responses? And finally, how would some of your challenging situations be different if you choose to be a different dog, right? Okay, so remember that triggering situation you wrote down, hopefully you wrote down or you, maybe you're thinking about it right, right now. Remember, I was gonna come back around to that. Here I am, I'm back around to it. <laughs> Which dog were you in that situation, okay? Do not judge yourself. If you were attack or self doubt, just, Go, oh, this is what I was. Oh, it's awareness. That's empowerment right there. And how could you improve your response in the future? How can you improve your response tomorrow when you go back to the veterinary clinic where all your old triggers are sitting there waiting to tri trip you up, right? Would you choose a different dog? And how would that affect your response? How would that affect the situation? How would that affect the other person? 
And again, I've said this over and over and over, but this is a practice and you're going to try and you're going to miss and you're going to try and you're going to miss and you're going to try and you're going to miss and you're going to try and you're going to try and you're going to try. And at some point you're going to hit the bullseye and you're going to go, that feels good, right? So just keep practicing. And all of this, all of this is so that all of you, my friends, can be this. I'll let you read the slide. This is my most shared, photographed, awesome slide ever, I think that I've ever made. Becky says, I think I'll post the watch and wait dog on every exam room door until it becomes second nature. Yes, you have to get the reminders. I encourage you, you guys should be able to have this slide deck. I hope Megan gives it to all of you. You can take it, you can share it with your own staff members. Hey staff members, hopefully you're watching this. And then you can post the dogs up and go, which dog are you going to choose? Because the, the dog that you choose affects the life that you live. And all of us deserve to live a life that is unfuckwithable, right? Okay, so I am indebted to the work of Louise Evans, who wrote a, a book called Five Chairs, Five Choices. She um, really inspired me a lot on this presentation. She has a TED Talk that's awesome. Totally check it out. Totally check out her book or website. Love, Louise, you're awesome. And um, I have to say thank you on so many levels to Bariner Ingelheim for sponsoring this. Literally, I did not talk about any of their products at all, but they care so much about the emotional and mental wellness of our of our industry and our profession so thank you so much for um sponsoring this so i think i'm going to turn this back over to megan at this point right oh <gasps> thanks melissa i'm so excited thank you for saying nice things oh thank you tina thank you connie yay megan you still there hello yep i'm right here okay it looks like we only had one question come through Okay. And it says, what if the person you're dealing with is truly an a-hole? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. Well, that happens all the time. And in those situations, the only thing you can control is yourself. And so I think when that person is an a-hole, you have to go to the assertive dog. You have to literally set up your boundaries. You have to decide what you will tolerate and what you will not. And that has to be a personal decision within you. You do not have to join them in their assholery at all. You can continue to maintain your ability to stay in your cognitive levels and be aware that their behavior is just not going to facilitate the relationship any further. And you can choose to terminate it at that point. Um, I know some of us may not be in those situations. I was an associate doctor for years and it's, and for a long time I felt like a victim and I was powerless and I just had to deal with jerk clients. And at some point I just was like, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to do it. And so you have to decide what you will and will not tolerate. And, um, most importantly, do not join them in their bad behavior. Stay above it. Stay in your cognitive be kind continually and know that their behavior says way more about them than it says about you and know and feel confident in that. Is that a good answer? I don't even know. Is that a good answer? I think it was a great answer. <laughs> <laughs> um, that looks like all the questions we had come through. It seems like everybody seemed to engage nicely in the chat. <laughs> got to have their interactions. I um, see a thing in there. Uh, I was saying, I was hoping you would say Perry the Platypus in your best Doofenshmirtz voice. So, um, yes, I don't know if there's any Phineas and Ferb fans out there, but I'm a huge fan of Phineas and Ferb. And one of my favorite things is when he goes, it's not the simple platypus. And then he goes, he puts his hat on and he says, Perry the Platypus. So there you go, Jennifer. <laughs> it looks like um, we also had another question come through in the chat uh, here whenever I walk into an exam room with an owner uh, presenting with their pet for euthanasia. I ask them how they're doing and then um, mm. then self-doubt dog initiates any advice. Well, I think the first thing is being aware that 
self-doubt dog has showed up, okay? And don't judge self-doubt dog for showing up. Self-doubt dog is just revealing that there's a part of you that needs healing, that needs to believe in himself or herself. And so ask self-doubt dog, why are you here? Right? And I know that's a little difficult if you are in the exam room. You may also want to say, hey, self-doubt dog, I acknowledge you. Thanks for being here. We'll chat after this. And learn to compartmentalize that and say, not now. Not now. And as much as you don't think that you are in control of that, you are absolutely 100% in control of the thoughts and feelings that come into your mind. And so if self-doubt dog shows up because that's what you have neurally wired, that's your pathway that you have, go, oh, I was waiting for you. Not surprised you showed up at all. Here, I understand you are revealing a part of me that still needs some work. We will chat after. And then come back to it after and go, why are you still here? Because that's revealing something within your own psyche that needs your attention. And that's a gift, right? If you can look at it as a gift, and a certain, a higher level of awareness about yourself, then you can learn something. So absolutely, every time that shows up, it's revealing something about yourself that needs to be healed. Uh, we also had another question come through the Q&A. If you have a staff member who is continuously upset by another person in the office who fails um, to do, how do you address this? Uh, well, I think, so I, I think it depends on whether you have any say into that particular situation. So if you are in a leadership position or not, if you are not in a leadership position, there's not much you can do. You can, um, you know, try to talk to people as a peer to peer and just offer your support and your ability to hear. Maybe they just don't feel like they're being heard. And so maybe you just offering to be a listening ear maybe that's all they need. Maybe they just keep bringing it up, bringing it up, bringing it up because they, they don't feel like it's being heard. If you are a person in a leadership position, then that is your time to say, hey guys, I have noticed this. Other staff members have noticed this. And for the health and safety and wellness of not only our staff, but our clients and our patients that we love and we care for so much, we've got to get this figured out. So we're going to sit down and we're going to talk about, you know, what you're mad about and what you're mad about. And we're going to try to get to a place of mutual understanding. And that, my friends, conflict, conflict res resolution, oh, that's a whole nother conversation. Um, so, but it really depends on whether you are um, in leadership or not. And if you are not in leadership and you go to talk to your leadership about it and nothing is done, then you have a decision to, and, and it's impacting your own emotional and mental wellness, wellness in a way that's negative, then you have to make a decision, okay? You are either gonna stay there and you are going to you know, manage yourself and not be affected by it, or you're gonna leave, right? Or you're gonna stay there and you're gonna be mad or affected by it, okay? You got three choices and you're gonna have to pick one of them. Um, and a lot of times when you look at it that way, it becomes a lot clearer about the way to move forward. That looks like all the questions we had come through the Q&A. Seems like we have some great suggestions also coming through in the chat. Yeah, definitely. So with that, I think we will let you all you know, uh, sit back and, and let all this sink in. Um, thank you for joining us tonight. Um, thank you um, to both BI for sponsoring this event. We really appreciate that we're able to help bring this to our community. Thank you, Dr. Wooten, for sharing your knowledge and experiences with us. We really appreciate it at this time. Absolutely. Um, we are recording this. A webinar again if technology stays in our favor this will be posted to the PA VMA website for free access um, we many things were mentioned tonight um, that I will be sending via email to all of you who were in attendance as well as we will provide those links on our website with the recording 
Uh, be sure to continue checking the pavma.org website for updates um, on our webinar series. We are about to announce our online CE series, which will be offered free to members. Um, we'll continue offering COVID-19 related resources on our main page, so feel free to reach out to us with any questions that you're having um, while we navigate this new world we're living in. So again, thank you all so much and have a great night.